Coming up, the Truman Presidential Museum shutters its doors in Independence. Where else might you be inconvenienced in the Metro by the DC budget debacle? And sometimes the federal budget acts can cut deep how local kids are being chopped from the Head Start program. Also this week, the hits and misses in Kansas City as the Metro starts Obamacare. Plus this half hour, art under fire. And two years ago today, baby Lisa disappeared. Are there really still no answers? Hello, I'm Nick Haynes, and thank you for joining us again on the program that goes beyond the soundbite and takes you behind the headlines, making news in Kansas City, reviewing those news headlines this week from the Kansas City Star nationally syndicated columnist Mary Sanchez, from 41 Action News reporter and weekend anchor Lindsay Shively, KCPT special correspondent Sam Zeff, and star reporter, columnist, and blogger Dave Helling. Harry Truman's home and presidential museum closes its doors in independence this week, one of the most visible casualties of the federal shutdown in our metro. Where else, though, were Kansas Cityans being inconvenienced this week as a result of Democrats and Republicans not being able to agree on a budget in Washington, Dave Helling? Well, uh, the most inconvenienced Kansas Cityans are those who work for the federal government, of course. They were either furloughed indefinitely with no pay or required to work and postpone getting a paycheck. And then there's a whole series of ripple effects whenever the federal government shuts down. It's harder to get VA benefits processed, although the VA hospital, of course, stayed open. Harder to apply for Social Security benefits, although Social Security checks go out. Uh, you, you, people forget the, the impact of the federal government in Kansas City ranges across a broad range of activities. EPA, Army Corps of Engineers, Defense Department, HHS. Uh, uh, you know, there's a whole range of activities, all of which will be slowed down because now, of because we do think that down. Sprint or Cerner is the largest employer in our metropolitan area, but it is the federal government, Mary. It is the federal government, and that's partly because we have so many regional offices here with the federal government. But I mean, I think you know, Dave makes a great point. It's like people forget in their daily tirades against government just how often they're touched by it. And the longer this goes on, I think you will start to see more of those ramifications far beyond just the people who work for the government or those who might be getting, um, you know, like WIC assistance that's supposed to run out within a couple months. Um, you know, there's all sorts of ramifications on this. You know, well, a lot of we've and we've heard certainly from federal workers uh, right here at KCPT who are complaining. You know, they're destitute now, uh, Sam, because they're not getting paid. But presumably, when all of this is over, won't they get their pay back? Well, I don't think that is a foregone conclusion. Okay. I think that's probably going to happen. Let me just also quickly mention with the, uh, with the shooting at the Capitol uh, this week, uh, there are plenty of uh, federal employees in Kansas City who carry a badge and a gun uh, who are out there working and not getting paid. To me, I think that is really an outrage. Lindsay, it was your station showing the footage there of the Harry Truman Presidential mm -hmm. Museum. And people forget about that. Uh, Absolutely. But you had people, you were showing people who were coming across the country going to that museum this week and a shock to see those doors closed. We don't always make those connections. And we tried to, they was trying to visit every single presidential library. He'd been planning it for a long time. I mean, just a tourist that was affected by this. I asked Senator McCaskill, what are we going to see here? Because we don't have a lot of national sites that are closing. She said the biggest thing is going to be the economy because if the federal government is the largest employer, these people, and they've told us, an EPA worker says, I'm not spending extra money right now. I don't want my next check is coming, so I'm just going to hold off. Now, our federal elected officials, though, are feeling the pain themselves and are willing to feel the pain because they are actually going to forgo their own salaries, aren't they, Dave Helling? Well, they can't. Uh, constitutionally forego their salaries, although okay. some have said they're going to give it to... I thought like to, Kevin Yoder and Sam they're all Graves give it to, are all saying, I'm giving it all check, back, I'm giving it all give it back. to charity. It, it's uh, quite a stunt. It's a uh, stunt, okay. Uh, and, and let's just be clear, the, yeah. the Office of Personnel Management has said that essential employees, what they call accepted employees in the federal service, who are still on the job, will get paid. Now, they won't get paid in their regular cycle until the appropriations bills are passed, but no one is going to work for free. But for the, those in the workforce who were sent home as non-essential or non-accepted employees, it's possible they'll never get that money back. And Nick, that comes after a summer of sequester cuts when many federal employees were furloughed 
because of the budget cuts in the spring, March and April. So they've had a summer of furloughs, now another indefinite furlough. It's a tough time to be a federal worker here or anywhere in the United States. Well, what about those, uh, I said, Kevin Yoda, Sam Graves, Vicki Hartzler, all of our uh, local congressional delegation, including Emmanuel Cleaver, saying they're not going sure. uh, to accept uh, their pay during this period of time. Dave Halling saying that's just a stunt, but well, for the members of the public, don't we feel like, well, at least they're at least feeling some of the pain? I don't feel it. You I mean, they are the cause of the pain. Here, here's the point. They need to feel some pain. And both Democrats and Republicans at this point definitely need to take some hits on this. They need to feel the pain later from their constituents. They need to hear it in the ballot box. I mean, it's just, it's ridiculous. Any good PR person would tell any of those congressional members, look, you need to make it feel like that you're feeling something too, that this is also hurting you. That's like 101. But, they, but, but not only were they not uh, taking their pay, as we, we sort of heard from their own press releases that uh, littered my mailbox this week and yours too, Dave Helen. Sure we know uh, that we also saw on your money. station, Lindsay, I mean, they're also meeting uh, honor, f honor Guard flights coming in of yes. veterans into Washington. They're meeting those individuals and showing support for them even though they can't go to national monuments at the same time I mean they, they seem to be caring you seem a group of veterans right. that has risked their lives and so such a deserving group it just kind of makes the squabble seem small it's like petty. you know petty compared to what these men and women have gone through and want to see a couple of things Nick we, first of all we should say members of Congress make one hundred and seventy four thousand dollars a year that's more than any federal employee in the general schedule service can earn. The top for, for a GS employee is $129,000. Second, it's frankly been a week of stunts in Washington. Empty chairs, news conferences with doctors, cancer patients, the honor flight problem. Uh, you know, I told somebody at the Star the other day, I feel more like a movie reviewer than a political reporter because I'm reviewing stunts. It does make some sense to turn to our members of Congress and say, don't worry about whether you're getting paid or not. Sit in a room and fund the government that we all pay for. And so far, that hasn't happened. Around 250 kids in Metro Kansas City are being denied access to the program that prepares low-income children for school. In our region, more than 1,500 children in Missouri and over 550 in Kansas are losing their head start slots. On KCPT's The Local Show last night, special correspondent Sam Zeff took a closer look at cuts to head start. Here's an excerpt from that extended report. Just because you're poor doesn't mean you shouldn't be able to get a, an education. Diana moved to Lee's summit with her three children, including Elijah here, who just turned five, a few months ago. Separated from her husband, she was literally banking on free Head Start classes for high-quality preschool for her youngest. But along came sequestration, and the Head Start program in Lee's Summit was cut. When you go out to our Head Start program, it's such a rich program. Uh, it provides not only that preschool experience for that young child, but their family, education, health, nutrition. It's so wide-ranging. Here's something you didn't know about Head Start. All meals are served family style. For many of these preschoolers, this is the only time they will ever sit down at a table to eat. And here's something else you probably didn't know. Besides brushing their teeth to this catchy tune, Head Start students get basic dental and health care. The program also offers support to their entire family. So we work hard to put them in touch with any resources that might meet any needs that they have that come up, on top of providing social emotional skill-based practices and um, academics, of course, which we focus on to really try to get them on a parallel playing field when they get to kindergarten because there are some high demands these days when you get into the school system. It didn't enter my mind that there would be no Head Start. It simply did not enter my mind which leaves parents like Diana Heck to fend for themselves. Diana works full time, but makes only eight fifty dollars an hour. Instead of free Head Start, she says she spends $400 a month for Elijah's preschool. That's one entire paycheck. Did it ever occur to you that the, the, the craziness of, of Congress, that you have the Budget Control Act, and then you have the sequester, and then and then somehow it all rolls downhill to you in Lee's Summit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it's affecting 
little kids, which is, again, they're our future. They're our future. You can see Sam's full report on the rebroadcast of the local show Sunday evening at 5.30 on KCPT. Now, the problems for Head Start predate the current government shutdown. This was all part of the so-called sequestration, those automatic federal budget cuts that went into effect earlier this year, which we're all told at the time wouldn't have a sizable impact on people's lives. So clearly it meant more than just the cancellation of those public tours of the White House, Sam. Uh, absolutely. Uh, and across the, across the country, 57,000 disadvantaged children are no longer uh, in Head Start. It's affected uh, every state, every part of every state. Uh, and Head Start is, is crucial for some of these kids. As we pointed out in the piece, it's not just about academics. It, uh, for a lot of these kids, this is the only time they see a dentist. It's oftentimes the only time that they, uh, that they get any sort of medical care. Uh, if they have an earache, if they have a cold, that's where they can go to have this done, plus family help. The families, you know, it's all, it's a, it's a family uh, program where everybody gets a benefit. But the government doesn't have unlimited amounts of money, um, Mary Sanchez, and there have been concerns about the Head Start program. You've, there's been a number of articles written in the last year or so, including in Time magazine, about what the efficacy of Head Start is. Sure. There have always been concerns about Head Start, but some of that is just because of how it began. It was, you know, part of the War on Poverty program. People were against it to a certain extent from the get-go. There are certain groups that have continued in that vein. But you go out and tell any parent today of more economic means that it is not good to enroll your child in preschool. They know it. The things that these children are getting through Head Start, other parents know are smart to do. I mean, the long-term studies, some of them are very, they weren't well done, quite honestly. Certainly, there are things about Head Start that could be improved. We don't nearly fulfill the number of children that could actually meet the qualifications. I mean, we only serve, I think Wyandotte has the highest service rate in this area, but it's like 20% of the children that qualify receive it. You know, you can certainly make improvements to it, but tell me that early childhood learning doesn't work. That's insane. But of we course were, it does. But we were told originally, Dave Helling, that these, the sequestration really was only going to be just some cross-the-board cuts that we wouldn't really actually feel a lot of the weight well, of this. Well, right, but we forget that the sequestration cuts were supposed to be, in theory, so horrible that Congress would never go along with them. And they went into effect, and they've become sort of a baseline now. Even the uh, continuing resolution now being discussed in Washington would continue those cuts. Nick, we, we need to put this in a little bit of context, too. It isn't just Head Start. Medicaid wasn't expanded in Kansas and Missouri. That's a problem for poorer people. The House has voted to cut $4 billion a year for the next 10 years from food stamps. That also affects poor people. There is a real fraying, if you will, politically, of the safety net for the poorest residents in and around Kansas City. Uh, and, and, and the Head Start cuts are part of that pattern. Lindsay? And if you talk to Head Start officials, the people that run it will tell you they see it works when you have one family where some of the kids go through and some don't. Uh, Susan Knittle runs the YMCA delegate here. She says she was just in D.C. for a conference and met a man who was of uh, five children. Two went through. They have successful adulthood lives. The three that didn't have had problems with drugs, incarceration, severely troubled adulthoods. Sam. Quick point, you mentioned the time uh, piece. There was a, uh, a long uh, health and human services study which questioned whether or not uh, kids who come through Head Start really have that ac academic leg up, uh, first in first grade and, first, and then in third grade. I will point out that there have been other studies out there that, uh, that say, well, while we may not uh, boost them academically, there are studies that show over the long term, kids who have gone through a Head Start type program tend to be healthier, they tend to graduate from high school uh, and have better family lives. So that entire, you know, taking care of that entire child is really crucial. A downtown billboard featuring a gunman taking aim at Kansas City's iconic scout statue stirred up controversy in the metro this week. I didn't think much of it. No problems. No problems? No. People do double takes at this billboard. It's a little offensive. Why? <laughs> because you're shooting an Indian. I saw hate. Moses Brings Not Plenty me, can't get past his gut reaction. What was coming across was that, boy, kill the Indian. All right, an excerpt from Lindsay Shively's report on 41 Action News. What was the message, though, of the artist for this particular piece of work? Do we know that, Lindsay? Uh, we do. He has a large explanation on his website. Uh, the first thing that caught me is when he said this was in defense of the Native American. 
in defense because what he's taking aim at is a hollow, literally and figuratively, sculpture of what we think the Native American is now today in Kansas City, white culture's perception. Did you get that, Mary? Not really. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, I understand it when you read the explanation. I get it. I, to me, it's like, I wasn't that outraged by it. You know, they took it down quick because it was one guy. Okay, so because uh, we, we were tried to shoot it on Monday, and right. we tried to get our report, and then it was it was taken down. Now, why, why was it taken down when it was supposed to be up until the end of the month? So the company that owns the billboards is a private company, yeah. and they haven't returned any calls about why. Neither is the artist. Yes. But they purchased it through October. Okay. So why, why was this deemed so controversial that it had to be taken down when, for instance, a, a, another piece of art that we've talked about relentlessly on this program and other places, over the, uh, which is the bare-breasted bronze of the Arboretum, which we talked about on the program last week even, uh, still remains at the Arboretum in southern Johnson County, whereas this caused so much controversy, it had to be taken down so swiftly. I wish that uh, somebody would uh, return their phone calls uh, and say, quite frankly, when I saw the uh, picture of it in the newspaper and I saw it on television, I wasn't all that offended either. I mean, I think art is supposed to challenge you. I think in some ways it's supposed to be perplexing and, uh, and mysterious. Uh, and I, I think that if it makes you think in, uh, in a different way, I think it's fine. Uh, and why they took it down, I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, if, if I'm anything, I am a First Amendment super freak. So I, uh, I fully support uh, people putting up uh, art. And if some people are offended, and uh, then so be it. You know, a lot of the people that have raised issue with the Overland Park Ar Arboretum statue and this billboard, uh, it's about context. This won an art competition to be on a billboard through another private company who then decided mm, this is not in an art gallery where people are going to be expecting a message and looking for it. This is a billboard. You drive by at a glance. He has his website in the very far corner of this, but it's hard to see from the street. And the same woman that wanted the petition for the Overland Park Arboretum statue, it's not an art gallery. It's where children will be. That was her issue with it. So don't go looking, though, for this in the Crossroads District. It is gone. It's gone. All righty. In just a moment, the hits and misses as the Metro starts Obamacare. But first, we want to draw your attention to a program that hits KCPT and Kansas City Week in Review next week. Frontline investigates what the NFL knew and when they knew it. You can't go against the NFL. They'll squash you. As Frontline delivers its NFL expose Tuesday night at 8 on a week in review next week, we form a unique partnership with KCTV5 to examine the local impact of concussions on high school athletics. We talk to bereaved parents who've lost their children to football injuries and examine whether regulations governing school sports in Kansas and Missouri do enough to protect young athletes. And on KCBT's The Local Show, Thursday night at 7, former chief Will Shields and how local doctors test for concussions. That's all next week on KCPT. But back to this week. One of the most important components of the Affordable Care Act went online Tuesday as millions of uninsured Americans got their first chance to enroll in the health insurance marketplace. Nationally, the media amplified reports of technical glitches and long waits to try and log in to the government's official health care website. What was the experience, though, in our neck of the woods, Sam? I have an, my own personal experience with it. Uh, on uh, October 1st, I went there. It took me all day just to register uh, to open up an account. And to be honest with you, since that time, periodically I've tried to go back, log on to the site to actually uh, examine the, uh, the health care uh, options in Kansas, and I've been unable to do so. But let's not panic. We have a long time uh, I'm to do this. Uh, okay. If you need to go to the health care exchange and buy health insurance, I think that in, uh, in the coming weeks you're going to be able to successfully do that. Because you don't have to do it all in the, that first day or that first week, do you, no, Dave? you have six months. Uh, it, it, you need to purchase by December 15th in order for it to take effect by January 1 in order to avoid the tax penalties that are applied. But if you miss that deadline, you're still eligible until March 31st, and then there'll be another sign-up period next year. What I found interesting in sort of talking to people who were trying to subscribe to the website, Nick, remember in Kansas and Missouri, you both, both states have to use the federal website since both states declined to open their own exchanges, was that the people who were enthusiastic about this product, and there were many, tended to be older, probably a little sicker, a few pre-existing conditions, as you might imagine the case to be, a lot of unemployed people. 
But the only way the exchanges are going to work is if they get a lot of young people. And I do get the sense that the young people are waiting. <laughs> you know, the people who are healthy don't really feel like they need it, and they're not going to the website yet. They'll probably go in later October, early November to get the coverage they think Mary? they need. Well, Dave's actually, I mean, he's right. That, that is the whole, the broader picture of this, which I think is important to keep that in mind as well. You know, the news this week was as people were trying to log in. That's technicalities. You can fix that. The long-term deal with Obamacare, though, is will it work? Are people going to have better outcomes, better health outcomes? Are costs going to be lowered? And will those younger workers, will those people log on enough and sign up so to offset the cost? Now, you did some reporting on this, Lindsay, and yeah. it certainly was late in terms of the training that a lot of the healthcare navigators uh, all got on yes. this. Yes, yes. Such a dramatic change anyway for everybody, and we don't have the details leading up to October 1st. And then you find out the uh, marketplace navigators, which will be licensed by the state of Missouri, can't get their training done. Same issue. They went to show me online the training they were doing. They joked, you better come back at midnight, because they only got availability to the training starting in September. Everybody was trying to figure out this thing coming October 1st, but October 1st wasn't a deadline. Right, just opening. We, we should point out that there is some feeling that the state of Missouri particularly made training for navigation and signing up for navigation purposely difficult because there is some effort to sort of throw a few uh, uh, cogs into the machinery here. And if you take a look at what navigators have to fill out just to qualify, it's like a three-page document. I looked at it this morning. So there, th that plays into it, too. Um, but I do think that most of the people I talked with were patient excited about access to this pro uh, product. They understood there would be some glitches. You didn't have people going, you know, stomping out of the Swope Center saying, well, this is, you know, destroyed, wrecked. I don't want to be a part of it. I do think people understood it was going to be difficult. Just down the road in Branson, a 54-year-old institution, the Shepherd of the Hills Outdoor Theater, is shutting its doors. And in a statement, its longtime owners cite costs associated with a new federal health care law as part of the reason for their closure after half a century of business. Now, is there more to that story? Is Obamacare to blame or just a convenient excuse for other problems? Well, I happen to think that, well, first of all, uh, tourism in Branton uh, has been trending down over the last couple of years. There's fewer people going there. Uh, and I think after 54 years, maybe they need a new show. Uh, and that maybe that might bring some more people in there. I really, I agree with you, Nick. I think this was just a convenient uh, way of, of, uh, of getting out of, uh, of whatever business uh, that they're in after 54 good years. But uh, I think at some point to, to blame Obamacare is uh, disingenuous. Yeah, another couple of learning lessons from a situation like this, Nick. Business owners were required, of those with 50 or more employees are required to provide health, some sort of health insurance to their employees or pay a penalty, but that mandate was delayed for a year. So if the Shepherd of the Hills production had more than 50 employees, it's not likely they were forced into closing just because of Obamacare because they don't have to provide that insurance. Under 50, you can get tax credits and help uh, from the government to provide employees uh, health coverage if you want to. You're not, you don't have to. So uh, my guess is that maybe this was thrown in for political reasons more than practical ones. We don't talk much about crime on this program, but as this was a massive national and international story when it broke, we would be remiss in reviewing this week's news if we did not mention that today marks the two-year anniversary of the disappearance of Kansas City infant Lisa Irwin. Her parents say the baby was kidnapped from her Northland home. In the first year after her disappearance, detectives received more than 1,600 tips. Now police say they're lucky to get one a week. And now two years have passed, Lindsay, and authorities are still no closer to establishing how she disappeared? No, everyone has their theories. Nothing has come to light that seems like a probable case for what has happened to this child. And with the new information this week, authorities released this age progression photograph that we're going to put on your screen of how she would look today. Now, it looks remarkably strange to see that ourselves. How did her parents react when uh, they saw that, Lindsay? They didn't know uh, the day it was coming from National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. They just got an envelope in the mail. Jeremy Irwin says they opened it up and the mother, Deborah, just immediately broke down, which, you know, as a mother, you can understand what she's going through. It looks like, wow, what have I been missing of my child's life if she's still alive and they believe she is. Jeremy was able to control himself, he says, because he just keeps telling himself that's not necessarily her. What I found remarkable, though, they've remained very hopeful. And the next day after they saw this, they were joking, not joking, lightheartedly commenting, 
I always knew she'd have a red tint to her hair because her mom does. Yes. Very difficult. This is a story, Mary, that was on people, you know, it was in People magazine. You'd see it on yeah. newsstands, it became so big, but a, a case that still captures uh, huge amounts of attention two years afterwards, and we still have no clues to the identity or whatever happened to this child? No, I mean, no one really knows, as Lindsay was saying. I mean, it, it, it's a mystery, and people do like to follow mysteries, and of course, it, you know, involves a chi an innocent child, so we're, of course, concerned. What offended me then and would offend me now is if the circus starts again. This was a horrible tragedy, no matter what happened, no matter who was involved in what has occurred to this little girl. And it was just horrific, the circus that came around um, and encircled these people. Some of the help that came from out of town was quite ridiculous. How about the age progression photograph? I mean, it seemed to me that it seemed unusual, but I'm, I'm assuming that happens in a lot of other cases. I just had not seen it. In, in that type of case before. Absolutely. Uh, both parents submitted pictures of themselves as children, and this took a while to make up. And a lot of people comment on, wow, that looks older than a three-year-old. Exactly. They have to last a few years. They only do one every couple of years. So it's actually closer to what she'd look at four or five mm -hmm. years old. Well, that is our week in review. Our thanks to our news reviewers from the Kansas City Star, Mary Sanchez, and KCPT special correspondent, Sam Zeff, the Star's Dave Helling, and from 41 Action News, Lindsay Shively. I'm Nick Haynes from all of us here at KCPT. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us.